Good evening and Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that you've given to us. And despite the blustery cold and the thing that they call old man winter, your people have showed up to celebrate your birth. And whether your birth was this month or in the spring, it's not the point of contention. It's that we're here to celebrate that you did come for us and you did shed your blood on Calvary to forgive us of our sins. We thank you for this time and we just sanctify it and we just pray that your message goes forth and you give me the strength and the clarity to present what you've given me to present. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I've titled this A Season of Silence. A Season of Silence. I'll start with a familiar verse that we've all heard. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in his dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for with that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now when all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Which being interpreted is, God with us. Amen. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Amen. Now we've all heard that story many times. It's a traditional Christmas story that we find in Matthew. But for this season, as we talk about a season of silence, all the hustle and bustle, all the temptations to buy and sell and to give and to talk and to text, I bring forth to you a man named Joseph. Joseph was never mentioned in the Bible as recording one word. You see, Joseph had a reputation, and I believe it was an honorable reputation. He was a carpenter. He was a holy man. He was an honest man. But he was presented with a situation, just like you and me, friend, were presented with some situations, just like Sister Ter Teresa told us, you know, sometimes in this year we've had situations we just don't know what to do with. We just don't know where to go with. Nor do we have an answer. I've said this many times. The only sad thing that separates people in the Bible from you and me is just time. It's just time. You see, our story is just like Joseph. And as we record what he said, or what he didn't say. It shows him sitting here in a quandary. But while he thought on these things. How many people have thought on some things this year? Mm -hmm. How many people have thought on some things today? That mm -hmm. you look at it and you say, you know what? I don't really have an answer. I don't really have a clear direction. Well, neither did Joseph. And he was just like you and me. He was an honorable man. He had a reputation. A master carpenter. He wasn't just some random person. And he was thinking on these things, and he didn't know what to do. The Bible records an angel showing up to Joseph in a dream and giving him specific directions, telling him to do something. In fact, in this passage, it could be argued 
that he saw an angel twice. And he was told to do two specific things. He was told to take Mary as his wife. He didn't know what was going on. What? I, my, my wife is pregnant? My, by not another man, by the Holy Spirit? How can this be? Even I question that. How can this be? I don't understand it. Nor do most of us. But the Bible states that it was a true thing. Joseph did not want me to be, be embarrassed. He was thinking, how am I going to get out of this situation? How am I going to rectify this? How many of us have thought about that? How am I going to get out of this situation? How am I going to approach the situation with, the, with, with everyone's best interest in mind? Or how, 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 am I going to, how am I going to make this work? Joseph was told to fear not. I think we've been commanded as Christians to fear not. Amen. We've been told to fear not. And it's very interesting to me that Joseph, after he saw this angel, was raised from sleep in the second time, as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto his wife, and knew her not. You see, I talk about a season of silence. Very shortly, I'm going to show you a situation where somebody had an interaction. The same thing that I'm talking to you about. He was ministered to by an angel, and he was commanded to do something. But you know what? He spoke against the angel. He didn't practice the season of silence. And friend, I'm not telling you it's an easy thing sometimes to sit in silence. I'm not telling you it's an easy thing to wait on the Lord. I'm not telling you it's the, 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 the best advice that I could give. But in this season, where the Lord tells us to fear not, and to sit and wait upon him, I think that's the only advice that I could give you. As we sit here, it might not be our traditional Christmas message. We can all talk about how Mary came and how what a joyous season it was. And it was a joyous season. But for Joseph, it was a difficult season. You see, he didn't see the whole situation through. He didn't know what was going to be on the back end of this. He didn't know that his firstborn son through Mary was going to be the savior of the world. He didn't know that he'd stumble upon him in the tabernacle in the temple performing miracles and as a young lad teaching the Pharisees and the scribes the book of knowledge. He didn't know that. All he knew was the angel appeared and directed him to do something. And as he sat in silence and obedience he followed through. In Matthew 2 Verse 13 through 15. And when they were departed, the, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Again, again, we can argue this is the third time that an angel appeared to Joseph. Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. Difficult words to stomach, a difficult situation. Arise, flee into Egypt, for your family is in danger. Perhaps one day we'll hear those words from the Lord. Or an angel will appear and give us specific directions. Do this now. Go here immediately. And if we're not in tune with the season of silence, we're going to miss that. We're going to miss that. You see, we're going to turn to our phone. We're going to turn to our TV. We're going to turn to our food or our, 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 our fun time. And we may miss the direction that was given to us. See, Joseph was still in tune. And he said, Until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Bible historians say that when Herod slew every young child, every Jewish child that was two years younger, it was a ten-mile radius from that temple where he was. See, King Herod was the king there. He was an evil man. And he wanted that power. He wanted to be the only one. And he knew just like people know today, that there is another king. And there is another king coming one day to rectify this world. Amen. You see, and that's exactly what they feared. And that's what Herod feared. 
Now Joseph heard the angel, and he arose and he left. Ten miles. Think of ten miles from this point right now. That a soldier would show up with a sword, and every male child two years and younger, younger would be put to death. Did it happen? Of course it happened. Absolutely it happened. And if Joseph had not been in tune, if it had not been a season of silence for him, what might have happened to Jesus? See, the ultimate thing was for the devil to kill Jesus. He didn't want him to go to the cross for your sins. He didn't want him to go to the cross for my sins. He wanted to end that. Because if you could have killed Jesus, he wouldn't be here right now, friend. There would have been no blood shed on Calvary for our sins. There would have been no redemption, no possibility of eternal life. Matthew 2, 19-23. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. It's the fourth time. Saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose, and took the young child, and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. And he, and he shall be called a Nazarene. And that's where our story begins. For the Christians on this earth that believe that Jesus came, the story started in the city of Nazareth. He was a Nazarite. He was a Nazarite. He went there. He was... That was his home. That's where he was raised. You know what? I believe Joseph played an instrumental part in all of this. During that season of silence, he listened. I have to believe that as these angelic showings became more frequent, one, two, three, and four, I have to believe that he waited upon the Lord. I don't think he made a move until he heard from the Lord. Friend, do we make a move before we hear from the Lord? What do we do? What do I do? Sometimes we just play out and do what we want to do. Because what do we want to do? We want to be in control. We don't want to wait for the angel of the Lord. We want to talk. We want to read. We want to show. We want to whatever it is. And the angel of the Lord is there. And he's saying, let me appear to you, friend. Let me show myself to you. Let me bring you the word of the Lord. You see, these angels that appear, we weren't just beings with feathers and big wings that were just floating around. No, they were messengers of the Lord. They had a specific thing to be sent. A specific thing that was said to keep us safe. Now I want to bring you to one other story. It's found in Luke chapter 1. Now after I just gave that presentation on Joseph, I don't want you to think that this next story, that Zacharias was any less of a Christian. Zacharias was a holy man. He also was an honorable man. He wasn't just your run-of-the-mill person. He also was a servant of the Lord. But in the same situation that Joseph was presented with, Zacharias played his cards a little different. And as Christians, as people who are imperfect, people who have not attained spiritual perfection, sometimes we play our cards wrong. And sometimes God gets mad at us. And I'll show you here. Verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. I told you, Zacharias was a, he was a priest. He was a holy man. 
He was a respectable person. He was by all accounts what you would say today was a Christian. And he's in the altar. And he's been praying. He's been seeking the face of the Lord. And the Lord appeared. He appeared by way of an angel. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. And fear fell upon him. Again, I just presented the story of Joseph. And the angel told him to fear not. Fear fell upon Zacharias, as fear might fall upon us someday. That's right. I don't know what I would do if I saw an angel of the Lord right now. Amen. Bible historians say that we can't see the full face of an angel because the glory of the Lord that would shine would be so great that it would overpower us because we're such an, uh, an anemic person. We haven't been transformed yet. But he did send angels. They were kind of scaled down. And this angel appeared to Zacharias. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Now we could preach a sermon right there. Friend, the Lord does hear our prayers. Right? He might not answer us when we want to. He might not send that angel when, he, uh, when we think he should send that angel. But the Lord does hear our prayers. When he chooses or how he chooses to answer them, I have no insight into it. But the Bible tells us and it commands us that he does hear our prayers. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And she, he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, turn the hearts of the father to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. This is where the story takes a turn. The angel of the Lord came. He confirmed everything that Zacharias had been praying for. He told him what would happen. He told him the blessing that he was about to receive. He told him what the, what the blessing of John would be and how he would make way and prepare for the Lord. Now, Zacharias wasn't ignorant of these things. He was a priest. He'd been studying the prophecies. That was his job. And the angel of the Lord's there. The messenger from the Lord with this, this great, this great news. And Zacharias questions it. Where shall I know this? Sometimes, friend, even though we're Christians, we make errors. Sometimes we question what the Lord told us. Sometimes we ask too many questions and it's not the season of silence. I don't know what distracted Zacharias. I don't know what was inside his spiritual foundation that Joseph had. See, Joseph just up and listened. He arose. He did what he was supposed to do. And Zacharias lingered. And he asked a question. Wherefore shall I know this? And the angel, verse 19, answering, said unto him, I am Gabriel. Now I told you that God just doesn't send a bunch of bums to send his message. He sent Gabriel. Now he names the angel. A powerful angel. Amen. A very powerful angel. It wasn't Bob or Bill or Pete. He sent Gabriel to give this, this awe-inspiring message. And Zacharias questions him. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show you these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. Isn't it ironic? That the angel cursed Zacharias for a short time of silence. Not able to speak. Took it. See, sometimes when we question the Lord, 
as Christians, when we're not supposed to, the Lord takes something from us. Not because He hates us. Not because He doesn't love us. But to teach us a lesson. So that the next time He speaks to us, we'll have that listening ear. You see, Zacharias, he was dumb for nine months. Not dumb in this term of being intellectually dumb, but he couldn't speak. There was a forced silence. Now imagine if some of us were silenced for nine months. Imagine if some of us didn't have the ability to speak or defend ourselves or to give our opinion or tell people what, what we think or whatever. Only forced to use your ears. And if you study it, Zacharias would communicate with a, a pen and a piece of paper. You think I could keep up with some of you in a conversation with a pen and a piece of paper? No. Probably not. It would be very difficult. Zacharias was taught a lesson. Zacharias wasn't any less of a Christian. He wasn't ousted from his faith. He just made an error. And my message to us tonight is we can't afford to make those errors in this last and final hour. We can't afford to make those errors. Am I saying, don't speak to God? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, don't have a relationship with Him. I'm not saying, don't question Him sometimes when, when, when you don't feel something's going your way or you want clarity on something. God says He's our Father. He's our friend. Come to me. But when God presents a situation to us that's so clear, and it's so clear to me that Gabriel, an angel, came, and you still feel the need to question that, God doesn't shine too greatly upon that. Because he's saying, you know what, this is the time for you to be submissive and obedient and to listen to exactly what I'm saying. Amen. And it came to pass, verse 59, that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. See, nine months, eight days later, here's the prophet John, the cousin of Jesus, him that would prepare the way. And they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. It was tradition back then, just like it's tradition here. The firstborn son many times takes the name of his father. And the people thought they had it all right. Ah, we're just going to call him Zacharias. And his mother answered and said, not so. But he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. Imagine that spectacle. Zacharias, a priest of the Lord, standing there, and this little baby's here about to be circumcised, and making signs, and they're making signs to him, and uh, writing on tablets or feathers, or whatever they did. And Zacharias, he knows now, I have a message from the Lord. I, I, this needs to be done now, right? I need to rectify this. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, his name is John. And they marveled all, and his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loose, and he spake and praised God. I think the Lord tested Zacharias then. He didn't allow him to say the name John. He made him write it first. I think the Lord redeems us. I know the Lord redeems us. But first he makes us perform an action. Right? He makes us do something to test our faith. And he tested Zacharias there. And he said, you know what? You're going to write that on a tablet. Right? That's going to be the proof that you're listening. And then I'm going to lose your tongue. You see, in our lives, the Lord looks for proof. He looks for us to write that thing on the tablet to make it known. And he says, you know what? I will redeem you. I haven't lost you. I haven't forsaken you. I'm just teaching you a hard lesson. And sometimes those hard lessons are hard to learn. Not everyone here is Joseph. I'm not even Joseph. I don't know exactly what I would have done if the angel said, hey, arise. I don't know if an angel showed up right now if I would get up and arise. I don't know. I like to have the faith to think that I would do the right thing. I like to have the faith to think that I wouldn't be Zacharias and question that angel. I would like to have the faith to think that you would do the same thing. You see, that's why we have to be prayed up. 
That's why we have to look in our Bibles and read it and have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's going to come. Amen. He's going to minister to us and he's going to give us direction in this last and final hour. There might not always be a church for you to come to. Right? There might not always be a pastor here to minister to you. We're on borrowed time, friend. The church is on borrowed time. Amen. Not always going to be a church here. And God help us. Perhaps he'll rescue us and the rapture of the church will happen. But before that, I think the hard times will come. And Jesus is asking us, hey, are you Joseph or you're Zacharias right now? Not any less of a Christian, either one of them. But one listened immediately, and one had to be silent for nine months because he questioned. He, he was silent. And, you know, I can't say it enough. Neither person, neither, neither one was a dishonorable person. They just went about the situation differently. And you look at the, the life of Joseph, and you know, you talk about Joseph of the Old Testament that went to Egypt and became a, a powerful ruler. And his life was pretty much sin free from what the Bible tells us. And you look at the Joseph that is in the New Testament, and you can't really find much about him. He was the father of Jesus, he saw an angel many times, he was a carpenter, and he obeyed. That's what I might want my life to be. That's what I want your life to be. It's the obedience and the submission to Christ as he ministers to us. And you know what? People think, well, an angel's not going to come see me. You know, an angel not, might not see you. But the Holy Spirit is ministering right now. Right. And that Holy Spirit, that was the gift in the book of Acts, ministers to us right now as I speak. And the Holy Spirit's coming to each and every one of us. And he's presenting us with a situation or an answer or a duty. You see, it might not be Gabriel the angel. It might not be some angelic thing that you see in a dream or a vision. But he's here right now. Right where you're sitting. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to each and every one of us. And he's bringing us a message. He's bringing us a message from the Most High. And the Holy Spirit's asking each and every one of us right now, will you be obedient with that word? Will you submit to what the Lord is telling you to do? Will you be a servant of the Most High? Because this is a test. This is a test of our faith. Yeah, we can come here, we can just talk about Mary and Joseph and the gifts, and that's all great. I like gifts. But there's more to the Christmas story than just gifts. You see, the gifts wouldn't have been there if it wasn't the obedience of Joseph. He led his family. He protected Jesus. And he said, you know what? I will do what I'm asked to do. And friends, sometimes it's not very easy. And we've all had situations this year and today or whatever time period you want to put on that we've questioned. And we have to go back and we have to ask ourselves, did I do that with the Lord? Or did I do that with my own power? And the Lord will give us an out. He'll redeem us. But sometimes he punishes us. And he says, you know what? I'm doing this for the next time. The next time, it might save your life. And you look at the time that Joseph was visited by the angels. It became more and more dire circumstances. It wasn't just take Mary as your wife. Right. It was get out of town. They're going to kill you. Right. right? And... And in this last day, the final hours, I don't know what the Lord's going to say to us. I don't know. But I don't want to be in that position. And I don't want to be the person that says, I didn't warn you. That the angel of the Lord showed up. Or the Holy Spirit came with a message that woke you up. And you decided, hey, I'm tired. I'd rather go back to bed. You see, it's a temptation that we all have. We all have that temptation. Myself included. Say, you know what? Eh. I'll wait till later. I'll wait till later. As I said in the beginning of the service, Joseph didn't have the opportunity to wait till later. He didn't have the opportunity. He didn't have nine months to watch his son uh, grow in his wife's womb like Zacharias did. It was a life and death situation. And he did what was asked. This is a season of silence. Not because it's a bad thing. 
But it's a season of silence to sit back and listen to what the Holy Spirit has for us. And the words that He might minister to us. Because you know what, friend? We might not meet like this ever again. There might not be a Christmas service next year. They might tell us, you know what? We're not worshiping in here anymore. It's happened. We can't put anything past what might happen. And I'm not saying that's a thing to fear. That's a thing to rejoice about. Because in those times and situations, that's when the Lord comes and He speaks. And it's so clear to us. And we know exactly what we're supposed to do. And the tragedy of it is, is a Christian that knows what he's supposed to do, but just doesn't do it. Friend, that's disobedience. In this hour, as we celebrate Christmas and we go home to our families and we eat and we celebrate and we say hi to people and give gifts, I want you to think about that. Because the Lord's going to continue to talk to us. That just doesn't end when we walk out this door. I have to believe that Joseph was, uh, just, just because he saw those angelic beings four times, he, he had to be in the spirit for, for the entirety of Jesus' life. He had to be hearing. He had to be uh, uh, next to that altar, speaking and, and listening. And it, it just amazes me that sometimes, as Christians, we get so distracted, myself included. We get distracted by the cares of this world or what my dad says, what they can do to us. They can't do anything to us. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. He came as a baby to be born, to die on a cross for your sins and for my sins. Right. And as we celebrate the rest of this season and we make our way out of this church, I want you to take special attention to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Even as he ministers to us now, what am I supposed to be doing? Where am I supposed to be going? Because friend, in this final hour, I have to believe that at some point, we're going to be in a life or death situation. That's right. We're going to be in a life or death situation. And God will not forsake us. He will send us a messenger. It's our choice. Do I submit immediately and do as I'm told? Or do I stand around like Zacharias and say, I don't know, is this real? Friend, this is real. Dear Heavenly Father, as we close the sermon part of this service and we meditate on the words that were spoken, and Joseph and Zacharias and the spirit that ministered to them and the, the words that we were, they were given. I just ask that you'd spend a, send a special spirit of clarity to the church tonight. Those that are distracted. Those that have lost their way. Those that are seeking. I pray the Holy Spirit right now ministers to the hearts and souls of the people and the sound of my voice right now. Those who have lost their direction. Those who are angry at the Lord. Those who have questioned beyond what they should question. I pray that you send a spirit of clarity to the Holy Spirit right now. That we can apply this message to our lives. I mean, look at Joseph. I mean, look at Zacharias. And we can say, you know what? Lord, how can I submit more? How can I be obedient more? How can I make more time for you? These aren't always the easiest things to say. They aren't always the easiest things to do. But they're the most necessary things that we can do in this last and final hour. As the choir comes and we sing our last song, O Holy Night, I again pray over this service and the people that came. And I thank you for that holy night where you sent your one and only son, knowing that he was going to come and die 33 years later on that cross, die a brutal death, so that we could stand here under the sound of the voice that is spoken. We can stand here and we can celebrate your birth, but not just stopping with your birth, your resurrection and your promise of eternal life. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.